We already have two people in the waiting room. That's cool. So people can access at any time, right? Right. Once it's taped. Terrific. So this is one of the few summer classes that we're offering through the co-op. The good news is we will have live in-person classes beginning in the fall. Um, we will continue to have a virtual element though. So for those of you who are attending from outside of the Duluth, Minnesota area, you'll still be able to find our classes on Eventbrite and they'll still continue to be free for those virtual attendees. Yeah, so this is not showing a picture anymore. Oh, what happened? <laughs> and hopefully you all can also see the live transcript, which is at the bottom of the screen. So if you're having any trouble hearing, you'll be able to read it. Should we start? All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you, Debbie. Go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks for coming today. My name is Debbie Ortman. I've lived here for 33 years on this been organic, um, organically gardening for uh, over 35 years. And it actually first started, somebody gave me a subscription when I uh, bought my first house back in 1981 uh, to Organic Gardening Magazine. And that is really what started my um, love of growing things organically and my educational process with um, incorporating everything that I read with what I was doing in my own garden. And I still use a lot of those practices today. Today, we're gonna to focus on natural pest control. And there are just so many alternatives to using all of the chemicals uh, and products that you can buy in most of your hardware stores and garden centers. And so we're gonna go through those. I've got, you know, I've added a few things to the list actually. Uh, and if you have any questions, please just let me know. For those of you that are here, you could just raise your hand if you have a question, and especially if I don't cover something. But this class is gonna be quick and easy, it's one hour. Um, and I, you know, I taught this class last year, even during the pandemic, uh, I had about 12 people that attended last year here in my backyard, we were all spaced six feet apart, and it worked out really well, and it was just one hour. So when it comes to pest control, most people go to their local garden center or hardware store and buy whatever traps and poisons are available. But instead of using pesticides, which include herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, and rodenticides, there are many natural methods homeowners can use. Why be concerned about using pesticides? Reports from the World Health Organization and the United Nations Environmental Program they estimate that worldwide over 1 million human beings are poisoned by pesticides every year. 20,000 of the poisonings are fatal, 20,000. Pesticides are the leading cause of work-related deaths in some Latin American countries. Domestic pets like dogs and cats are affected and die from exposure to pesticides. A study done by the United States National Cancer Institute showed that in households where home or garden pesticides are used, children are up to six times more likely to develop leukemia. Mm -hmm. What works and what does not? I think many homeowners often use trial and error, that's me, <laughs> to answer that question or just kind of plain common sense. Sometimes it can be simple, like never leaving dog food outside, which attracts rodents like rats. If you want to keep wasps and hornets away from your picnic, set out a container of maple syrup or sweet um, uh, uh, maple syrup or honey or any kind of a sweet treat several feet away. They will be attracted to it and leave your picnic alone. But I'll talk a little bit more about hornets and wasps later. Identification and life cycle. There are entire books written about natural pest control. So not every pest problem you may be experiencing will be addressed in this class, but I'll try. I'm addressing the major ones. The first step in pest control is identifying what type of pest is causing the problem. Pest identification. I belong to a Facebook group called Duluth Area Backyard Gardeners, and I will tell you lots of people post pictures. What's causing this? What is this pest? And so pest identification is really important. And I highly recommend 
getting a copy of this. This is called Max Field Guide, and it's specifically for the Midwest. It pertains right to um, us in Northern Minnesota here. And it's good garden bugs on one side and the bad ones on the other side. So you can easily identify which is which. Now I do have some of these for sale. I, I'm selling them for the same price. You can get them on Amazon, which is $6 a piece. So if you wanna buy one of these, you can buy one from me. I've got a pile over here. So it, you have to identify what the pest is. Then educate yourself. There's so much resources available on the internet, but educate yourself about what is the life cycle of that pest. And what, you know, like when are they the most pronounced? Like if deer are your number one pest, figure out when are the deer in your yard? Is it during the night when you're not there? Is it early morning? Is it late afternoon? Because then you can be better prepared for using one of the natural methods for helping to deter them. And that is pretty much the basic goal for most uh, natural pest methods is not to kill them, um, but to help to deter them, prevent them from doing the damage in the first place. Uh, there are also many um, books available at garden centers. Your libraries are just a great source, hundreds of books um, on pest control and natural methods. So, you know, use those resources. Um, let's see. So once the pest is identified, it becomes a matter of trying to uh, figure out which of the different natural methods is going to be the most effective. And again, that's that kind of trial and error that a lot of us gardeners end up going through. Learn its life cycle because that often helps you control, to control it better. And so I showed you about the Max Field Guide. So we're going to start with ants. Ants are a big problem. People don't want ants in their kitchen, those cute little red ants. They don't want ants in their yard, especially if you have biting ants. Uh, and you don't want um, ants maybe in your uh, fruit trees or your plants because they actually have a symbiotic relationship with aphids. So a lot of people find if you are having uh, ant problems, you're having aphid problems, if you're having aphid problems, guess what? You're going to find ants because they kind of feed each other. So the first thing that I recommend for um, trying to prevent the ants from coming into the house, obviously you need to caulk. Now ants are super small. So even if you do your best job like we have of caulking all around the house and especially over in the uh, kitchen side of the house, those ants are darn small and can pretty much find their way into any house. There are several natural remedies available. I have used lemon juice to wash down my counters, which is supposed to deter them, but it doesn't last very long because it evaporates. And once it evaporates, it's not effective. So if all natural remedies that you might have tried are still not working, do not use any kind of the ant poisons that you sprinkle around the outside of the foundations. They are very toxic. They kill beneficial insects. Um, they can also be ingested by your pet and they can leach into the soil. So don't use any of those methods. The small ant poison traps that you can buy in the store are the least toxic and many on the market contain borax and a sweetener. And we're actually going to make some of those right now. And here we have several at the different types of ants. Um, I mainly use my ant traps uh, in the kitchen. I'll put some on top of the counter when I first start seeing ants in the spring. Uh, and then I also put them underneath the sink. And then I will put some in the yard where we, I know we have biting ants because I don't like biting ants. I don't know about the rest of you, but uh, so here's how you're going to make them. So get out here. Everyone has two cups. So get your two cups. So basically how to make it is so easy. You just get a little Dixie cup. You can either get this size or get the smaller size. The size doesn't matter. You fill it with one tablespoon of borax, 20 mule team borax. So you take the borax, you put one tablespoon in and then I will pass it around. This is some of my uh, uh, expired uh, homemade spicy plum syrup. And so you can use jam, jelly, honey, anything, but you wanna mix an even amount in, this might take a couple of tablespoons and I'll pass this around because all of you guys are gonna make yours today. Might even take, depending upon how much borax I put in there. So you make a slurry like this and I will pass this around. So take as many tablespoons you want, half and half. So half of the borax and half of the my syrup. 
So you end up with a slurry like this. And what happens is you need something sweet that will attract the ants. And then the borax, actually they will ingest it. They'll take it back to the nest and it will kill the entire nest. And borax is a naturally occurring mineral. So once you've done this, then you take some cling wrap. Debbie, both cups are just one. No, do everybody get so take home two cups. So okay. fill up both of yours. Okay. And then everybody should have two cling wrap tops to cut. So you take cling wrap, which, and I don't like to use plastic, but it's, you don't have to use this if you don't want to, if you're like a lot of people like me who really just like plastic, but sometimes it's kind of necessary. You don't need to use this to cover the, the cup. And the reason why I like to cover them though is, so here's your cup, here's your um, mixed ingredients inside, is because now it's waterproof. If you cover it, if you can put it out uncovered and they'll just climb up and go in over the side. But if you are concerned about rain getting in there and diluting it, you can do this and then everybody should have two so you'll get to make yours as soon as they pass it on. So you put your cover, your cling wrap cover, put the rubber band around and now it holds it in place. So now this is waterproof. So if you do get rain, it's not going to dilute this ingredients inside. If you aren't gonna put a top on, just put it out anywhere where you're seeing ants. We typically have ants, um, biting ants um, in my compost pile. Um, that are in containers. So I'll put you know, one of these traps over there, but anywhere where you have ant problems inside the house or outside, uh, you can put this. Now, make sure this isn't gonna be accessible to small children or to pets. Again, if you put this on your kitchen counter or under your kitchen sink, it should be fine. And so then if you're going to use the plastic cover, what you wanna do is right above, You'll, you don't, don't do this now because you'll take these home with you. These are your little ant traps to try at home. You'll want to pierce the little hole right above where the ingredients are. So you'll be able to see where the ingredients are. Like right now, it's about right here. And then I just punch three holes, one, two, three, big enough so that an ant can climb into it. And so they'll climb into it, ingest it, take it back. And within three to four days, the ants will be totally gone. So this is, this is the best thing that I have found for controlling ants. Any questions on that? I also heard that uh, 20 meal team borax is good for spiders. So oh. if you have spider problems, you can sprinkle a little bit in the corner of your room. Well, that's a great idea. I, I don't know if that works or not, but it would be <laughs> worth a try. Um, so let's see. So that is ants. Now we're going to get to aphids. Keep on working on your little ant traps. Uh, aphids attack a variety of fruit trees and vegetable plants and some flowers. You can use a soap spray, but that's not always feasible on a large fruit tree. We have a plum tree that typically attracts the aphids. And so it's a little hard to like spray that whole tree with a soap solution. Plus, if you are gonna use a soap solution, and you can use either ivory soap and dilute it in a water for a little spray bottle, or you can use um, you know, any Dawn detergent, you know, anything that is uh, you know, fairly generic for the soap. And you wanna use, I'd say about a 10, 10 to 90% solution. So 10% of the soap to 90% uh, water in a spray bottle. And here's the deal though, if you're using that, you can only apply it on plants on a cloudy day or early in the morning or late in the evening. You cannot, if you use a soap spray on any plants, be the house plant, or well, house plants would be okay, but be um, anything like on your deck or in your garden and the sun hits it, it will kill that plant. So you can use the soap spray but you have to put it on, let it sit for about 30 minutes on a cloudy day, or like I said, early in the morning before the sun hits that plant or late at night. And then you have to rinse it off and you have to thoroughly rinse off that soap. And again, this is to get rid of aphids. So you have to be thorough with that. I actually prefer on my fruit trees because they're so big, when I discover the aphids, I immediately order some ladybugs. This year I ordered 3000 ladybugs 
And my favorite place to order them is Nature's Good Guys. A lot of other places sell ladybugs and I won't mention their names, but I will tell you most of them by the time they get to your house, you're lucky if 25% have survived in transport. Nature's Good Guys, I would say I have probably 99% survival of those ladybugs. And when they come out and you release them, they're voracious. And it's interesting that it's not the actually beetle that eats the most of the aphids, it's their offspring. So they will mate and lay eggs. And when those eggs hatch, it's to kind of an interesting looking um, uh, little free beetle form, but that really can eat every single aphid. Um, not, I mean, a, a bunch of them can eat every single aphid on my uh, plum tree. But you always have to be watching. So like as soon as you start seeing a pest, that's when you wanna start doing your investigation and figuring out what's gonna work best for controlling it. So that's aphids. Next is apple maggots. You can see this, I'm doing this in alphabetical order. <laughs> so apple maggots, um, these are flies that emerge from the soil in the spring and they will lay their eggs on the emerging uh, apple fruit. And then that those eggs will turn into maggots that will eat the inside of your apple. And then that apple drops on the ground, it overwinters, they crawl out, they go into the soil, overwinter, and then they emerge the next year. We have found the most effective method are these red spheres that you can buy online. A lot of the garden centers do sell these. And what you do is you want to close them up like this. I, we order them by the case because we have several fruit trees. And so every spring we either replenish the ones we had from last year, if they're reusable and salvageable, or we make new ones. And they come with this cute little hook so you can hook it around a branch. And then you want to use Tanglefoot, which we're going to use a little bit to create some sticky traps. But Tanglefoot is really um, very effective because it'll, the flies, when they first emerge out of the soil, will be attracted to the red on these um, spheres. And they, as soon as they get close to it, this Tanglefoot is so sticky, they immediately will stick to it. And then to reuse them, you just kind of scrape it off in the fall so that it'll be ready to go next year. And you might need to apply some more Tanglefoot. Tanglefoot, you can get uh, and I like it in this kind of a container. Hopefully you guys can see it. I'll open up this one. And I have extras of these bottles, so you can buy some if you want for me. But most garden centers sell this. And this is my favorite dispenser because it comes with a really handy duty brush inside. I'm not having a real good luck taking this off. But it's super sticky. So if you're gonna deal with Tangle put it all, like putting it on these spheres or the sticky traps we're going to be making, wear gloves. Um, these are just, you know, medical gloves that you can then easily toss because otherwise it's really hard to get that sticky stuff off your fingers. But it's called Tangle Trap Sticky Coating. And I can't tell you if it's not toxic or not. I should have done. Does it say natural? It works naturally. I don't know if that means it's natural. <laughs> Sorry, I did do a little research on this beforehand, but I've been using this for years. It's very effective. I have never seen a beneficial um, atta attached to this. So I've never seen a butterfly or a bee. Uh, either they're too smart or, uh, you know, I'm not sure why, but even my other um, sticky traps that we're going to make today that I'll be showing you, I have never caught any beneficial on there. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as well. Uh, cabbage worms and tomato hornworms. I recommend BT, which is Bacillus thuringside or thuringiensis. And you can buy just a small bottle like this. They're pretty cheap, you know, six to eight bucks for a bottle. It's concentrated. This bottle, we have used it for about three years. And we spray all of our um, broccoli, all of our cold crops with it because it helps to prevent that cabbage uh, worm that really can decimate your, uh, especially your uh, brassias. So this is my favorite. Just one application? Well, what I do is, um, and you follow the directions, but I'll put this in a spray bottle 
And we go out and spray, as soon as we start seeing some damage that we know isn't from slugs or flea beetles or something else that we know for sure, it's, you know, the worm. And sometimes if you look on the underside of your cabbage crops, you can see the, the little green worm and then you know that you have the uh, cabbage worm. Uh, and then same with your tomato, the horn worm is very, it's very obvious. It's, uh, it, it looks a little bit more like a caterpillar that will go after and decimate your tomatoes. I, we've never had those here, so I've been fortunate, but we do have the cabbage worm. And so we typically will spray this um, almost every day until we get them under control. And you wanna spray not just the top side of the leaves, but actually it's more important to spray the underside. So I will lift the leaf up and spray it on the underside because that's typically where those worms hide. They call it a worm, but it really is, you know, more like a little caterpillar. They just blend right in. Yeah, they blend right in and they're hard to see. But if you don't catch them, they'll get bigger and bigger and, and really they can actually kill. I think I might've even lost one of my broccoli up there. Uh, it's my husband's job to spray the BT and he is not quite as diligent about certain things that I am. <laughs> I don't know if any of you know, some of you might have that. Yeah, some of you might have that, uh, that same problem. Uh, and you can use BT right up until a few days before you harvest your broccoli. So, you know, so it's very safe. This is um, certified organic. It is, this I will tell you, this is the main thing that most organic um, gardeners use. Uh, even for CSAs, you know, anyone who's certified organic, this has been approved for use. BT is a naturally occurring bacteria that's in the soil and they've been able to synthesize it and reproduce it and they have found it's very effective. Will that also work on the um, caterpillars that attack the azaleas? Um, well, you'd have to find out what type of caterpillar it is, but I would say it's pretty effective on uh, pretty much everything. So like my milkweed that I right now have monarchs on, uh, caterpillars on, I would not use this anywhere near my milkweed plants because um, obviously it's a beneficial, but for those type of pests that we want to get rid of, it's, it's, it's very effective. But yeah, I'd be, find out exactly what it is, but my hunch is it would work. And so is, is BT what they're spraying for gypsum moth? Uh, the question is, is BT what they're spraying for gypsy moth? Not that I'm aware of. I'm not a gypsy moth expert. Uh, but I believe that they are um, spraying something that is specifically targeted to the gypsy moth. I would be more concerned about the aerial spraying for mosquitoes because that will also kill beneficials. Um, any, any questions so far? No, nope. online. Okay, so now we're going to go to cutworms. And Typically, you only see this problem, or I've only noticed it being a problem when we uh, have a new area in the garden that we are now turning into uh, a growing area. Or if you have you know, lawn that you're now going to cut out some sod and start a garden in that area, because that's where the cutworms are. And they're a grub that lives in the soil, and they will emerge, and they will actually be able to, they wrap themselves around the stem of your new little cute little transplant or your new plant that's just emerging, they'll wrap it around and just cut it right off. So you'll go out there and find the whole plant just fallen over or gone. And there's several ways that you can deal with it. My favorite is I save up all of my to toilet paper rolls. Sorry, I didn't bring one with me because we don't have one uh, available right now. But I save them up um, all winter and then I will cut them in half so now you have two sections like this, and then each one of those sections, I will uh, cut that in half. So you can wrap it around them, uh, the entire stem of that plant and push it into the soil a little bit. And then the cutworm won't be able to get through that. My brother-in-law just told me what he uses, believe it or not, is a nail. He puts a nail right next to each little transplant that he's planted. And because it can't wrap itself around, because it pre that nail prevents it, it can't cut that plant off. So the only thing is, I don't know if I really, I might have a hard time finding those nails <laughs> after I had used them, because I would think over time they kind of would work their way down and get mixed with the soil. Um, so I don't know if that's such a great idea, but if you're you know, diligent and you would make sure you pulled all those nails up you know, after the plant, once the plant gets a certain size, 
the cutworms can't really wrap themselves totally around it. So it has to be able to totally wrap it around that stem of that plant for it to work. Maybe somebody suggested pencils too. Yeah, a pencil would be the same kind of, you know, as, like as a nail. Yeah. So if you've got a whole bunch of extra pencils, try pencils, <laughs> depending on how big your garden is. Uh, so that's cutworms. And then I thought I'd add deer. Um, when I taught the class last time, I didn't add deer, but I thought I would add deer uh, because so many people, especially here in northern Minnesota, and I know in other areas um, around the country, that is a major problem. Again, find out kind of, you know, when are the deer the biggest problem? Are you seeing the damage first thing in the morning so they've been grazing at night? Uh, you know, if you have an opportunity to put up a fence, um, we have a six foot fence around our 3,500 square foot garden. And that in the 33 years we've been here, we've only had a deer jump over that fence once and it immediately jumped out. So we think something was chasing it. But in 33 years, a six foot fence is, is definitely high enough. Sometimes they will say, oh, you need eight feet. But we have found that a six foot fence is just fine. But if you don't, aren't able to put up a fence, and for those of you who love hostas, because that's one of their favorite foods is hostas, but they also go after, you know, daylilies and, you know, a lot of flowers, a lot of plants. They can be very destructive, especially if you have a large number of deer that tend to congregate, you know, in your neighborhood and in your yard. I have found very effective to be Irish Spring. And I have a designated, um, Greater that I use just for my Irish Spring because it, I, you know, this has a very strong odor. So what I will do is I'll go out and again, I kind of figure out, you know, uh, when I'm having the problem. And for me, it's really uh, during the night is when we tend to have deer in our yard. So I'll go out, you know, after dinner and go around and just scrape some of this Irish spring, you don't need a whole lot, but I'll scrape it over some of the plants where I've seen the, you know, any deer damage. And even before seeing deer damage, I'll, I'll sprinkle this around, uh, especially on my hostas. And they leave it totally alone. And the cool thing is, a lot of times this will survive even after one or two rainfalls. It'll still be present because you'll be able to smell it. Uh, now, if you don't like the smell of Irish spring, uh, you're going to have to figure out something else that might work. I know that a lot of gardeners who have a lot of fruit trees, they will take a straight motion on the long bones and circular motion on the so far, Drill a hole in it and actually hang it from the uh, fruit trees. And that has acted as a real good deterrent to keep the deer from eating your, uh, you know, especially for younger fruit trees. It'll help to protect those tender ends that they really like. Was there a question? No, okay. somebody new joining us. Okay. So Irish Spring is my favorite for helping to deter deer. Flea beetles. I've been hearing from a lot of people that with these hot temperatures, they've been having a huge problem with flea beetles. It's really easy to see if you're having flea beetle problems. And fleas, they're actually a small black jumping beetle, super teeny, like teeny weeny. But they're a voracious pest they will damage plants by chewing numerous small holes in the leaves, which make them look as if they have been peppered by buckshot. So if you see a whole bunch of holes all over your plant, chances are it's flea beetles. And again, you should be able to, if you lift up the leaf or if you go out early in the morning, you should be able to see the, the flea beetles. And especially if you see them jump, you'll know that that's a flea beetle. I tend to have problems with flea beetles, especially in my um, strawberry patch. I'll go out to pick a strawberry and there'll be a little hole in the fruit and inside will be a little black flea beetle that of course I just squish when I see them. But they also have been going after my uh, grape leaves. For some reason in my garden, those are the two things I have a problem with. I was talking with a friend of mine who runs a CSA. They're having a major problem with flea beetles this year uh, in their cold crops. And um, I recommend using catnip. So I started this a number of years ago. Uh, I started growing catnip mainly for um, herbal medicinal purposes because it makes a really great tea and it has um, medicinal value to it. And I noticed that where I had my um, uh, catnip growing, I wasn't having problems with flea beetles. So about five, six years ago, I started planting catnip in my strawberry bed and underneath my grapevine and it has cut the flea beetle by 
but that wasn't enough for me. 50%, you know, you're still going to get some damage. And I don't mind sharing some of my produce with, you know, animals and insects, but uh, there's a certain point at which if they start really damaging your fruits and your vegetables to a certain extent, then it's time to take some action. So uh, this year I have tried catnip spray. So I went and harvested some of my catnip um, and boiled it in about two, uh, several stems and boiled it in about uh, two quarts, no more than two quarts, probably a gallon of water and brought it to a boil, a simmering boil. Then I let it cool down and then I strained it and I put it in a spray bottle. So I've been going out every morning and spraying my entire strawberry bed just lightly with this. And also I just noticed some damage, uh, flea beetle damage on my, the, for the very first time on some grape leaves. So I'll spray this now on the grape leaves and it's not gonna hurt the plant. It's not gonna you know, hurt the strawberry. It's not gonna change the flavor. Um, but I, so far I have found this to be helpful. So if I can get more to 75 to 80% protection for my fruits and vegetables with using a spray, I will. The other thing that I have also tried is obviously you're not going to want catnip growing everywhere. So if you want your catnip to grow and just plant it in a nice big patch, cut off the leaves, you know, cut off a whole stem with several, you know, leaves and branches, and then cut that and just cut it on top of your strawberry patch. Or I have now long stems that I cut off underneath my grapevines where I don't have the catnip growing. And that also seems to be effective. But does it attract cats, Debbie? <laughs> uh, well, if you have an outdoor cat, yes, it might attract the cat and they might start acting a little crazy. But again, as a spray, they'd have to chew the, 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 the stem or the leaf, which of course, if you do my, that one method that I suggested, you know, they would be able to get that. But again, we all know that we shouldn't be letting cats run free in the first place because they're the number one killers of our beautiful songbirds. We have neighbor's cats. My neighbor's cats. Yeah, uh, some people have recommended using, um, if your cats are coming into a certain area, you can have observed them kind of targeting a certain area. They recommend putting up uh, those plastic uh, fork tines, sticking plastic forks in the ground uh, and so just about, you know, like cutting them off maybe and just about this much of the pork tine emerging and they will leave it alone. They don't like walking on that. So you could try that. Other people have said that that works. Um, when populations are high for flea beetles, and again, they love this hot drought weather that we've been having in northern Minnesota, they can actually um, defoliate and kill an entire plant. And I noticed that when we were having flea beetle problems on my grapevines, it really diminished uh, the, um, how productive those grapevines were. Uh, there are several other things that you can recommend that are on the handout. Uh, and I would assume that the handout is available to people via Zoom. So I'm not gonna go over all those because I wanna make sure we have some time for questions and answers as well. Okay, so that is... So flies, now we're going to make the sticky traps. So, so put, your, put your gloves on everybody. And you can see I already made these sticky traps for everyone here. And basically it's a yellow cup that I have cut in half. Uh, when I started doing this several years ago, we had had a graduation party for one of our kids and the colors for um, Hermantown, Minnesota, where I live, is gold and blue. So I had a lot of these kind of yellow golden cups left over. So I thought, I'll try these. And I, because, you know, you see in the store where they're selling yellow sticky traps, especially for, um, for the uh, fungus gnats that can live in your soil and be in your house plants. So I thought, well, I'm going to try this outside and see, you know, how effective this is for a variety of unwanted pests. And I'll give you that more information. So put your gloves on because you're going to use your sticky trap or your, excuse me, use your tangle foot to put on the sticky trap and you really want to wear these gloves. So everybody's got their gloves, right? Spread out your newspaper because you're going to be doing this on the newspaper so you don't get any of the tangle foot on my nice white tables that are a little dirty right now. So basically you want to cut the, the plastic and then I just staple it onto 
either the really small um, sticks. What do they call these sticks? Popsicle sticks. Thank you, popsicle sticks. Um, or I like a tongue depressor, either one. And I like to have put two of them together and staple them here in the middle because you want this at about this height above the ground. You don't want it like, you know, you don't want it right here because when it rains, you're gonna get a lot of dirt covering this. And so I like them a little elevated because that's about at the height where uh, a lot of those flying insects, like, you know, the biting uh, gnats or noceums, uh, the flies and the mosquitoes, uh, at that height, you'll catch a lot, you'll be surprised. So then what you wanna do is take your tangle foot. And again, you wanna make sure you're doing this on the newspaper. And you're gonna be taking these home with you. So just open it up and you'll see it has a really nice little handy brush. And then what you're gonna do is you just want to coat all sides. And if you get some of it on the, the wooden popsicle sticks or craft sticks, craft sticks, that's just fine. And you wanna do both sides. All the way around, completely coated. And then wherever you might wanna place it, stick it in there. So like, I don't know if you guys can see online, you should be able to. Um, I have just seeded this with um, some uh, lettuce seed and uh, some um, uh, basil. And so I would just stick it in the soil like this. So you can see it's above the area. And believe it or not, when you come out the next day, you're gonna be shocked at how many bugs you see on there. I actually use this mainly for um, mosquito control. So I will make about 20 of these in the spring, right before mosquitoes emerge. And I will go, as soon as the mosquitoes come out, you know, especially after a nice rain, I'll go out there and these will be covered with mosquitoes. And my view is, my thinking is, I, I, this isn't scientific, is if you can catch a lot of mosquitoes in that first hatching, it will significantly decrease the mosquitoes throughout the year because you've caught those very first ones that can subsequently lay millions and millions of eggs for you know more mosquitoes to hatch. And I have noticed a decrease in the number of mosquitoes that we have in our yard. So I find it very effective for that, but also you will find those biting black flies, the little gnats that get along your hairline. They are covered with that. I also have found, um, we have a problem on our plum trees with uh, a weevil that's called the plum curculio. And I will find a lot of those on this as well. And I have also used these for catching that spotted wing drysophilia that's going after fruit trees. And I'll show you how to make us a trap just for those. Um, and that, that's why I have, so I have the vinegar, but you want to use, you want to make sure you have tangle foot too. Now here's something kind of interesting. About six years ago, when I first started this, five, six years ago, I thought I'm going to do an experiment. And I happen to have some other different colored plastic cups. And, and if you don't like using plastic, uh, be creative. You could probably paint something to put it out there. I have found that yellow is the best color because what I tried several years ago is I tried green, white, red, and yellow. And I will tell you the yellow had probably at least 50% more bugs on it than any of the other colors. So that's why I predominantly use yellow. Uh, and I also have never ever found a butterfly or a bee stuck on any of my sticking traps. And I've been doing this for several years now. And I will typically during a summer uh, probably put up anywhere from 50 to 75 throughout the whole year. So what I'll do is once my little sticky trap that I just made gets coated then, uh, or if it sometimes, you know, it falls over and it gets full of, you know, dirt, um, some soil or some um, uh, grass, then I'll toss it out and make some new ones. But I typically, my favorite is to put them out first thing in the spring. As soon as you are pretty sure that the mosquitoes are gonna emerge, you are gonna be surprised with how many mosquitoes you catch on this. Any questions? Now to take them home with you, wrap them up in the newspaper that you've already used to put the sticky trap on. And you can get that tangle foot, by the way, you can get this at, you know, garden centers. I know Dan Speedbin carries this, uh, but, and I, I also have some of these to sell. So if you wanna buy the one that you've used today, it's eight bucks. That's the same price I pay over at Dan Speedbin. 
So everybody's got there should now who's attended should have their two ant traps and their two sticky traps. Everyone's got theirs mm -hmm. and no questions. Well, oh, you guys are so easy. <laughs> so now we'll go to hornets and wasps. Um, this is the only one where I will suggest purchasing something from your um, uh, hardware store or your garden center. And I only do this because I'm severely allergic to hornets and wasps. And so uh, I found out just a few years ago uh, after being stung by quite a few that I had an allergic reaction. So I have done um, probably more so than most people to try and eradicate them from our yard. We have two and a half acres here. And part of it is if you, again, do your research. If you're, if you're seeing a lot of hornet and yellow jacket, um, and wasp uh, activity. Uh, and again, those are much more aggressive. You don't have to worry about bees or anything else. And, and the traps that I have here uh, will not catch bees, uh, uh, any other variety of bees. I've never found any one of the uh, bees. That, and we have, I don't know, how many varieties do you think we have in this area, Kate? Maybe 10 to 20 different types of bees. Um, so you can either use something like this or you can buy these traps at your hardware store. And I put them out only two times of the year. I put them out in the spring when we have like about a 60 degree day because I'll know that that's when they start emerging. And it's because I wanna trap those very first ones, those very first queens that have survived the winter. I wanna trap them when they first emerge so that they don't start a nest and I don't have to worry about walking in a part of my yard and being attacked by them because again, they're very aggressive. Uh, and then I also do this in the fall because in the fall, when they start producing queens, believe it or not, one nest can produce up to 200 queens that then will overwinter and start new nests next year. Now, granted, not all of those 200 queens will survive the winter, but enough of them will. And again, if you don't help to keep these under control, it will just increase the potential for them getting out of control in your yard. And I think it's just really important, especially if you are sensitive to these types of, um, you know, uh, stings and biting, in, you know, a biting type of an insect, that you need to do something like this. If you aren't, if you don't have an allergic reaction uh, and you don't have this problem, you probably don't need to worry about it. But I have found that that these traps work really well. And it's very easy to, to buy them online and to buy them. Uh, if you can't find them in your hardware store, you can buy these kind of traps online. And the nice thing about this trap is it actually has three different traps. You have a fur nom that you put down here. And so they can go in here and get trapped. Uh, they have a liquid bait that you can put in here. And then they have, you can even use this liquid bait to put in here. You can really actually make your own bait, um, liquid bait, because it's pretty much just like sugar water, uh, maybe a little apple cider vinegar or uh, some other kind of a, a liquid. Um, I have made some of my own, uh, and there's tons of recipes online for making your own uh, liquid bait. But I have just found um, that these are seem to be a little bit more effective. I don't know what they put in them. But if you don't want to buy something that might have uh, something harmful in it, you can make your own very easily by you know, finding out what those recipes are. Moles and voles are next. And that's where I have my huge bottle of cayenne pepper. And uh, cayenne pe pepper can be kind of expensive depending upon where you buy it. I'm not an advocate of Sam's Club, but this is where we got this huge bottle and it's lasted me for about three years. The best time to go after moles and voles that are in your vegetable garden area is in the fall, late fall. So because they're most active in the winter and that's when they will do most of their damage, um, especially um, blueberries, um, fruit trees, uh, any bulbs that you have, they'll go after any um, bulbs that you might have in the ground. They'll even go after your garlic, believe it or not. So what I do is right before, um, I want to wait until the temperature gets down to like about 20 here, 20 above. And then I will sprinkle this all around areas or especially if I've seen any holes already, I'll sprinkle it around and it totally works. The next year, we haven't had a problem with um, bowls and moles for I want to say three years now. 
because I did this and I do it every year, but I just sprinkle a little bit around and it just lasts forever. They don't like it. Some people have said this also works for uh, chipmunks and for squirrels. Um, I have not found it to be as effective uh, for those two if, if you have a problem with them um, being overpopulated in your area, but you could easily try it and see if it works. Any questions so far? Do you have a chipmunk remedy? Uh, yes, we can talk about chipmunks. So, uh, you know, if you have one or two chipmunks, that's not really a problem. The problem is because we live in, uh, you know, we've moved into their habitat in more rural areas. We've also then forced out a lot of their predators that would keep them in control, like um, fox, mink, uh, weasels, uh, you know, fishers, martens, those all help to keep both squirrels and chipmunks under control. So what I recommend is basically live trapping them and relocating them. And like one year we had 14 chipmunks. We could not even have a conversation right now because 14 chipmunks chittering like this, besides driving you crazy, you could hardly even have a conversation because they're so loud. Again, one or two, I don't know if you, you probably hear one or two that we might have around here, but that year it was like 14. There was just this explosion of chipmunks. And so we went and bought a small little trap and my husband would trap them and relocate them. And so that's what I would recommend for chipmunks. Either that or try also, well, it's actually somebody else has suggested something else. Um, do you remember seeing what somebody had posted, Kate, in that Facebook group? Was it, um, was it bobcat urine? It was some kind of a, some kind of a predator. Maybe it was fox urine. They had, you know, if you can, if you go to any of the uh, places that sell, you know, hunting equipment, uh, they will also have a lot of these different types of uh, urines that you can use in a spray bottle. You can dilute it into water and spray it. I actually tried that for skunks because we've had a skunk problem. In fact, two days ago, I came out here and noticed a few holes dug in our lawn. And it, you probably can't see the lawn uh, for those of you that are on uh, the Zoom, but you know we have a variety of plants that grow um, in our lawn. We're not into you know having this perfect looking lawn, but there are lots of grubs that live in the lawn and your skunks will dig holes to go after those grubs. So if you notice a lot of holes in your yard, uh, especially the next morning because they uh, skunks come out at night or you can even smell them at, a lot of times if you leave your windows open, that will be the skunks going after the grubs in your ground. And I uh, have tried for skunks. One year I bought a bunch of beneficial nematodes. Uh, the only problem with nematodes uh, and they will go after and kill the, uh, the grubs that they're after is it has to, you have to apply nematodes when it's raining hard. Because if you just apply it, yeah, you know, if it's not raining, they won't, the nematodes will die immediately and they won't be able to penetrate the ground and go into where those grubs are and then kill the grub. So you have to apply nematodes when it's really pouring rain because that rain will force those grubs further into the ground. Because grubs are typically anywhere from about, I'd say an inch to about three inches below the surface. So you wanna make sure those nematodes get that far down. So keep that in mind. I mean, they're pretty expensive to do the nematode method. Um, what I have tried too is I have sprinkled cayenne pepper around the yard, but again, for a big yard, you have to use quite a bit of cayenne pepper. And I didn't really feel that that uh, was that effective. How are we doing on time? I, it's uh, 12.49. Okay, perfect. And so um, just keep that in mind for trying to deal with, with skunks. Did that answer your question? Okay. okay, so we got moles and voles, uh, mosquitoes. Again, um, I really like using these sticky traps to collect the first ones that emerge. Uh, we also have used some of the bug zappers. Um, I'm a little cautious about recommending bug zappers because uh, they can attract um, uh, moss. And I haven't seen any butterflies, but I have seen moss. We have one um, zapper that we have on our deck and it is effective with killing mosquitoes. 
Uh, but again, you have to be careful. You don't want it to be um, also killing any beneficials. And a lot of people are concerned with, you know, it, 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 it is it's, the bug zappers don't discriminate between a mosquito and a fly and other insects. And so I'm a little cautious about that. The kind that we got has a very small opening. So it's very difficult for a, a, a moth bigger than about this to actually get in to be electrocuted. So, uh, so be aware if you are gonna buy one of those, um, how big the opening is. And that will help to prevent your, the, you know, the insects that you don't want to be eliminated. eliminated. Um, but again, I think my sticky traps have been the most effective that I've seen. Obviously too with mosquitoes, uh, you really want to make sure that you uh, don't leave water sources out, standing water. Um, so what I'll do is, especially after a rain, I'll walk around the whole yard and see where there might be some standing water. Uh, like let's say I might have a, left a cup out or on one of my um, saucers on the deck, make sure that there's no water because it really it takes you know, less than 48 hours for mosquitoes to lay their eggs and for them to hatch. We also have lots of rain barrels that we put up. And the nice thing about um, the rain barrels, they all have a um, mesh covering that prevents uh, any mosquitoes to get in and also to get out. Uh, then we will go to slugs. And I think slugs are the last one on the list. So for slugs, a lot of people try a variety of things. They can try diatomaceous earth, which is kind of expensive. And the problem with diatomaceous earth is one, you, one, you don't want to breathe it. You have to wear a mask when you're using diatomaceous earth because you don't want it to ingest that into your lungs, that powder into your lungs. Also, the problem with diatomaceous earth, once it gets wet, it is no longer effective. It will no longer kill slugs that then crawl over that diatomaceous earth. Another one that a lot of people like to use is sluggo, which is uh, actually iron phosphate, uh, again, a naturally occurring uh, mineral that uh, supposedly works. But one, sluggo is very expensive. And two, again, once it gets wet, it is no longer effective. And so we've, we have in the past years tried sluggo. And I really, I've never once actually seen a dead slug uh, where I had the sluggo. So what we have done, our tried and true method is buying the cheapest beer you can. <laughs> I think Dave, buy, my husband buys this uh, Pabst Blue Ribbon at our grocery store, you know, the, the you know, what is it, 3.5 or whatever strength for this beer. Does it even say that on here? No, it doesn't. Uh, a 24 pack for about six bucks. And we go through uh, probably three or four 24 packs in a, in a summer because our garden, unfortunately, is completely surrounded by wood, by a forested wooded area. And so we have a lot of slugs because we have more moisture for them to survive in. So you can do either one of two things, either get, you know, save like your little tuna can and just fill it up, you know, like about, oh, I'd say a quarter of an inch with some beer and put it out. You don't need to put it into the ground, you know, just put it right on top of the soil. They'll easily crawl up and go in and they drown. Or if you want to do like what we have done is we bought some of these containers and the nice thing about these are they come with the top. So if it rains, it doesn't dilute your beer. And again, you want to put these out primarily in the evening uh, because that's when slugs are most active is all night long. And you can see if you have slug damage because you, a lot of times you'll see their real, kind of um, glossy sticky trail um, on the ground or on your plants. And it's just real obvious that once you identify that it, what your pest is, and again, remember I got, the first thing I said is it's important to identify exactly what kind of a pest problem you have. If you can't find a bug uh, that seen, you're seeing some damage, chances are it's probably a slug because almost everybody has slug problems. So again, you just fill up the beer with about this much and that beer will last a good three, four days for attracting slugs. After that, we toss it out and then we use um, some fresh beer. <coughs> But I also check these every morning. Uh, that's the one thing I have found about natural pest control. It's pretty labor intensive, but again, it's a philosophy and it's really best for the environment and best for your family and best for the, um, the animals and the insects that surround us, uh, especially all the beneficials that we love. 
And again, for identifying what the beneficials are, this handy guide will tell you all of the beneficial bugs that you don't have to worry about, and then all of the ones that can hurt your vegetables and your flowers on the other side. So um, I go out every morning and invariably you'll find a whole bunch on the side that haven't gone in and drowned yet. And I just take a little you know, stick or something and just push them in and help them on their way. <laughs> but just so you can see how much these traps contain in here, I brought one from the garden. This has like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, about 14 slugs that are in here. You probably really can't see it on the Zoom. And here we have an interesting thing. We have black slugs, and then we have the uh, kind of beige colored slugs. But I'll pass this around so you can see just how effective, just how effective that method is. Let's see. Okay, now a lot of people have asked me about those high, um, those electric sound devices that you can put to help to deter like moles and voles and even supposedly for squ uh, squirrels and chipmunks, uh, they do not work. Uh, we have bought a couple different ones over the years and tried them and saw absolutely no difference. First of all, they're very expensive. And I also did a little research and I did not find any scientific study that showed that they actually worked. So again, I think it's kind of a gimmick. Uh, so I'd caution you to uh, not waste your money to mine those. Um, so healthy plants, well suited to our conditions that are growing here, are usually able to survive most pest infestations. It's when pests get out of control that it can affect what level of produce you get, be it from your fruits or your vegetables, and also um, you know how beautiful your pastas and your flowers are. It, it, so I recommend, besides identifying what the pest is, if it's not a huge problem, leave it alone. That's kind of my rule of thumb. I only do any of this if it becomes a problem where I'm seeing things uh, are just starting to really affect what is going to be the, um, how productive that plant is going to be. So use some of these you know, products Again, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them via email uh, or text. And just be careful following any application instructions whenever you use them, uh, such as wearing gloves, wearing a mask if you're gonna use diatomaceous earth or any other um, product. One of the things that we add to our garden is gypsum. We only use pelletized gypsum in, our, um, in my soil. And that adds calcium. It also helps to break up our clay soils that we have here. But you have to wear a mask because uh, it, the, uh, it, it is a, a mineral and you don't want to get, ingest that mineral into your lungs. But that's why we always recommend pelletized gypsum because it's pelletized. So it doesn't have the same harmful effects on your body as like a uh, powdered gypsum would. Um, let's see. There's more information um, uh, for additional information on your handouts. And there's also a list of resources. Uh, so again, there are many options for organic methods for pest control. Um, you can books on the internet, you're in the um, uh, library. Oh, and then I always like recommending this. This is called Slug Bread and Beheaded Thistles. I love the name of this. This is uh, written by a friend of mine, Alan Sambeck. Ellen wrote this probably 20 years ago. She's a, a Duluth resident. I believe she's still around. I haven't seen her for a while, but it's just, it's so much fun reading. And I'm sure you can um, probably still order this online or uh, see if your local library can get it for you. But it just covers, um, it's very, it's a very amusing, but it covers useful techniques for non-toxic gardening and housekeeping. So it covers both gardening and housekeeping. So if you haven't, I, I should have really picked one thing to read. Uh, like here, she for killing ants, she does have the borax. Oh, here's an interesting one. To kill rats and mice, leave an open box of powdered laundry starch. You can find laundry starch. People don't use, people don't starch their clothes anymore. Uh, where there are signs of rats and mouse activities, but you want to keep it out of the reach of children and pets. The rodents eat the starch and die of constipation. 
Well, isn't that an interesting tip? So that's how I will end this with a plug for my friend Alan's book. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for attending via Zoom. And I hope you've gleaned a few things out of this. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Feel free to unmute your microphone and speak now. I'm curious about the, the red bulbs. Please. Yeah. Do you put the tangle foot on the outside? Yeah. Okay. So you want to, um, what I have done is I staple this actually first and then put this clip on. Now it does, these have this little teeny notch here mm -hmm. to help hold this clip on but I found it easier to staple it. And then again, use my gloves, coat it with the tangle foot. And again, that's why I like these, this because it has the built-in um, uh, brush with it. A lot of the other tangle foot that you can buy at the store won't have a brush. So you'll have to find some way of uh, applying it yourself, but this is all self-contained. And then just put it on and then hang it up. Wonderful. Yeah. And again, do this first in the first thing in the spring. All right. Only just just the ones in the spring. They only these flies emerge um, that, that lay the apple of maggots only emerge in the spring. Okay. So and basically, we make sure that we've got fresh ones put out uh, when as soon as we start seeing the blossoms. That is when we start putting these out because shortly after they blossom is when they'll start. You know, as soon as they've been pollinated, they'll start producing the the little fruit and that. The fruit doesn't have to be very big for the for the flies to lay their eggs in that little bit of fruit. And we, when we first moved here 33 years ago, the apple trees that were already here were very infested with apple maggots. We, I mean, we basically could hardly, you know, eat any of the apples. We did this for uh, about two, three years in a row. After the third year, we've hardly seen any. So it's very effective. And if you had like that first year when we had such a bad infestation, we probably put about three or four of these on each one of the apple trees. So if you're if you are in an area or you move to a new house that has um, apple trees, if you see the apple maggots when you harvest them in the fall, then you'll know next year you should put several of these on, on a tree. Anything else? No, nope, I don't see any questions here. You put the, uh Break the Irish Spring right onto the plant. Yeah. So yeah. You rinse it off then, or just leave no. It? So I just put it on. So you'll just see, you know, like, you know, on the ground. I just put about that much on my hostas, okay. and you can hardly see it. And again, it stays on for a good two, three rains, unless it's you know one of those pouring rains that we do occasionally get. Oh, I know. I wanted did want to address the spotted wing, spotted wing Drysophilia, which kind of looks like a fruit fly, but it's not a fruit fly. This has been going after um, people's, uh, in particular, their raspberries. It will lay its eggs in the raspberries and you'll go to pick a raspberry and it will disintegrate in, in your hand. And then what happens is, uh, you know, if you uh, let that fruit fall that has it in it, it will overwinter in the winter and emerge. And it has become a major problem, mainly for uh, people growing raspberries, but also it will go after your blueberries and um, cherry trees it's gone after my cherries. So what you can do is, and I don't have the kind of cup that you need, but, oh, actually I can use this cup. So you wanna take some apple cider vinegar and put about two inches of that in the bottom of any kind of a cup. What they recommend online is a, you know, like one of the um, cups that you would get pop in that has a, a cover on it but any kind of a cup that you want. Pour a couple inches of the apple cider vinegar. It, only apple cider vinegar works. Then you want to take a sticky trap like that you've made with tangle foot on it and put it in. Actually, I would put it in like this. But you, want it, you want it right above the cider vinegar because the cider vinegar is what will attract the spotted wing drosophila in and then it will get stuck on the sticky trap. So how they had done it is somehow, oh yeah, they had, so if you use the ones with the top on it that you buy, you know, you can um, get when you check out somewhere, or if you go get uh, coffee or a smoothie or something, they recommend then um, hooking this onto the cover. So it kind of hangs like, it would hang kind of like that. 
and you'll be surprised how many of the spotted wing drysophilia you'll see. And again, they kind of look like a fruit fly, but nor fruit flies don't normally act the same way. I, I don't know if they're in the same um, family uh, genus, but they, you know, we've, we have them here. We started seeing them about four or five years ago in our raspberry patch. But the other thing I've done is I will take my sticky trap like this and put it underneath my raspberry plants. And I've noticed that they are loaded with the spotted wing drysophilia, the little, you know, uh, the little flies. Uh, another thing that I have used for that is um, you have to make sure that no fruit drops to the ground. So what we do is when we go out and pick our raspberries, which we'll be picking in about a week, I found one ripe one this morning, but so within the next week, they'll be ripening up. And what we do is we have two buckets, one for picking the, the good fruit, and then another one, if any of them do um, melt in our hand, you know, go liquid in our hand, or if any of them are on the ground, we pick every single piece of fruit up off the ground. So it's again, very labor intensive, but that has really cut down on that problem. Perfect. Okay. I added my email address um, for any of our attendees who would like to have the Zoom recording shared to them. Please go ahead and email me directly and I can share the recording to you. I hope everybody enjoyed today's class and got all the information. Again, Debbie has copies of the beneficial and bad books. And it's a nice strong copy. So if you'd like her to mail one of these to you, I believe it was six dollars for that. Yes. Um, she, her um, six dollars online on Amazon. Six dollars online on Amazon. Okay. So you can all check it out. And that was again Max M A C S Field Guide to beneficial and non beneficial bugs. So. We're going to wrap up today. Thank you everybody again for attending. I hope you enjoyed the class and have a wonderful rest of your Sunday, Saturday. Sorry, I'm ahead of myself. <laughs> Take care all. We're actually back to back to each other. It was my greenberry leaf.